I'm Sarah Kessler, a Mashable startup reporter. And it's, it's great to be introducing Dave Knox, who is the chief marketing officer for Rockfish, um, which is one of the fastest growing digital agencies in the country. Prior to Rockfish, Dave was a seven-year veteran of Procter & Gamble, where he was instrumental in the digital turnaround that led to, its proc to Procter & Gamble being named to AdAge's digital A-list. Dave has also been named to the iMedia 25 class of 2010 and by Media Industry News as a 2010 social media superstar. He is also the co-founder of The Brandery, a nonprofit seed stage venture accelerator. Please join me in giving Dave a warm welcome. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming out today. Uh, my name is Dave Knox. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Rockfish. And what I want to share with you today is what I call Partnership 2.0. It's the challenge of how brands and startups can work together. And this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. During my time at p and I led a lot of our relationships with Silicon Valley and working with startups of how can we bring innovation in and can, how can we better establish these relationships. And the challenge that we had at p and is it was a company that historically had formed you know, walls and moats and everything else around the world of startups. And it was because back in the day, magazines didn't pop up overnight. TV channels and TV stations didn't pop up overnight. But in the world of startups, they do. And it was a speed that we weren't, frankly, quite built for. So as I was doing this experience and looking at the world of startups and how really to partner together, I kept coming up with common things that I would hear both from the brand managers that I worked with but also the startups that I was interacting with day to day. And those things would be stuff like, startups don't return our phone calls. Time and time I'd hear from a brand manager and from our agency partners, you know, once one of these startups really starts getting big and taking off, they're just not returning our calls and we don't know how to work with them and what we need to do. But then on the flip, flip side, I'd hear from startups of, big brands are just difficult to work with and navigate. I don't understand who actually makes a decision. Is it the assistant brand manager, the brand manager, the marketing director? Is it the media agency, the digital agency? It was just all this confusion of who exactly do I need to talk to so I'm not running around in circles every single day. Because we know that for startups, distraction is what kills them. Because you have limited resources both with people, time, and money. And you don't have time to navigate and run around all these halls. I'd also hear things like startups aren't structured to work with us. But a lot of times this was because they were expecting ideas. They were expecting startups to bring them solutions of how do I do this, what, how can I do that? And that's not what startups are built for. They're built for building a great product first and foremost, not for wasting a ton of hours to come up with ideas on your behalf. But then I'd also hear things from startups of big brands move too slow. When we do bring them these great ideas, they don't know what to do with them. They don't act. They talk to me about fiscal years that have to take you know, not till next July, do they have money? And it's just all this slowness that comes about. End of the day, you'd hear startups don't understand brands and brands don't understand startups. But the thing is, this doesn't have to be the case because it's really not that complex of how the folks can work together. You know, the problem is that a lot of startups sometimes think that big brands act like this, and some do. They think about the shiny objects. The, I got this badge, I got that badge, look at all the cool stuff I'm doing. And some of them do think about this. They do think about, well, I just read this in Mashable, so now I need to run off and go sign a deal with this company because they were highlighted and it's the next big thing. But the problem is big brands oftentimes are actually not just dealing with that. What they're dealing with is this. They're dealing with this innovation funnel where they're going through a gauntlet to try and get something passed, where they have to explain to their general management about here's an idea, Here's what it does. It's not just a simple explanation, but it's justifying why people would do something. Why is this new startup something that people would actually do? You know, it's down to the same thing of when a big brand was first describing, here's what Foursquare is. You've got a general manager that might be 50 years old and has never actually used that service ever in their life. And you have to under explain, under, or explain to them not only what it is, but why it makes sense to do a deal with them. And it's really, really tough for a lot of brands to go through that because they're faced with this gauntlet of what they have to go through. The problem is that for both brands and for startups, easy is a word to describe other people's job when it comes to how they think about working 
and driving innovation through their business. Because they're working with a lot of established tools, the TV, the print, the mass media, that frankly still work to this day. They're not completely broken. They might not be as effective as they once were, but they still work. And you have to make a justification of why this new innovation is gonna be something that's worthwhile and can really be transformative for your business and for your brands when you've got ever decreasing budgets that have to be allocated to drive your business. When I thought about this and when I worked, uh, you know, both in my current job at Rockfish and at P&G, the fact of the matter is that you have to work together in order to make these deals between startups and brands really work in a meaningful way. And what that requires is a partnership, a partnership to really understand what each of you are doing and what each of you are faced with. You know, one of the first things from a tip of how to do this is to start with the fact that startups shouldn't be shiny objects and brands should not just be dollar signs. I was down at South by South this way, uh, South by Southwest this year and was listening to a panel that was talking about how exact same topic, how should brands and startups work together? And the gentleman that was up on stage working for a really big auto brand made the comment of, well, we work with startups for pop culture. We work with these startups so we can be cool. That's the exact wrong reason to work with a startup. You should be working with startups for an innovation standpoint, a way to really drive a better way to connect with people and connect with your consumers. That's the reason you work with these companies, and that's the reason you drive innovation. It's not to be cool, because that's the wrong reason to be spending money and working with a brand. Now, at the same token, startups need to be looking at the fact that a brand can really help their business. It shouldn't just be a dollar sign. It shouldn't just be a form of monetization to make your venture capitalists happy. It needs to be something that can be more than that, something that can really drive your business forward in a meaningful and different way. Because the fact is that brand managers are great marketers for the most part. They really know how to drive business and how to drive great experiences across the board. They spend millions, if not billions of dollars every year understanding consumers, understanding habits, practices, and everything else. So think about that value that can be added to your startup and to your business by really partnering with them. Not just thinking about what's the, the checkbook that you might be able to drive and the dollar figure you might be able to get, but what's the impact that can really be driven to my business in a big, meaningful way? You know, along with that, the second hurdle that you have to face, and you just have to come to the realization, is that there always will be a conflict in speed. And you just have to work against that. You know, brands often are thinking in fiscal years, uh, quarters, et cetera. They're planning ahead. They're not planning for next week or next month because those plans are already locked and they're moving on to the next thing. And that's an inherent conflict you're gonna have to deal with. That brand managers are setting their budgets, you know, take a P&G for example, in January, February, and March for 12 to 18 months from then. That's how they're planning and that's what they're working against. Most startups aren't thinking 12 to 18 months out for planning deals. It's just not how it works. You're worried about how to get from that seed funding to a series A, hopefully aspirational, one day you'll get to that series B, but that's a different type of speed that you're working against. And you just have to understand that up front. And there's ways to overcome it. It doesn't mean you have to be planning that far ahead. Brands are starting to think about innovation dollars. They're starting to think about you know, what's unfortunately called a test and learn budget, where they're working of having dollars set aside to be able to act faster, to be able to act a couple of months out. And so that is happening, but you have to understand that. If you're trying to get a brand to shift millions of dollars around, it's just not gonna happen as quick as you might want it to. And you have to understand that and work through it. The other conflict in speed you just have to embrace and accept is the fact there are a lot of stakeholders. Um, when you look at a typical brand, yes, you have a couple people that are working on that core brand within the halls, but then you are working with a lot of other stakeholders. And those stakeholders might be agency partners or it might be other types of partners. And you have to understand that you can't probably make the sell by going after one person you do have a selling process and a partnership process where it's gonna be multiple people you're talking with and embracing and going through. Now, the same thing as a brand needs to really embrace the fact that startups are motivated on a different type of speed. You know, they're worried about making payroll the next month, the next two months. Their job isn't as secure and cozy as those of us sitting in big, uh, big brands or big corporations. So understand that their speed that they're pushing at isn't because they're trying to push something down your throat, but it's because they're trying to get the deal so they can keep their business going. And that's an understanding that needs to be on both sides of the table. 
you know, the third fact is that realizing that both of you come from different levels and different places and different experience. That you might have a brand manager that's controlling millions of dollars in marketing budget that's been out of school just a couple of years, yet they've got a really big responsibility. But that same person might not have ever actually used the tool that you're trying to sell them. And that's a big difference today when you think about the evolution of marketing. 10 years ago, every item that went on a brand manager's budget was something they used in their personal life. Everybody watched TV, read magazines, saw billboards, shopped in stores. They knew all those choices that they were making. But then fast forward today and the speed of the evolution of things that are coming down the pipeline, not everybody has actually used the tools that they're personally having to buy and to experience. And you have to understand that when you're going in and talking to these and understand that there is gonna be some baseline education. But then on the flip side, you can't do a one size fits all. You might have a brand manager that is extremely proficient, that's reading Mashable every single morning, knows the things that are going on, and is using these tools in their day-to-day -day and personal lives, and you have to embrace that and accept that. Accept there, there are gonna be different levels of experience. Uh, and the same thing goes on the startup side, that not every startup CEO is a Mark Zuckerberg that dropped out of school and decided to start a startup. Some of them did come from the corporate world, have years upon years of experience in the very corporations that they're selling to. And those are different levels. And it can't be a one size fits all as any of the two sides approach this way of doing business and going forward. You know, and the final point of how they can think and work together is that they really can help each other be better at business. I don't know how many times I saw a startup that would come to me and be doing a pitch and doing a talk and there would be some, something fundamentally flawed with how their business model worked for brands, where it just didn't fit, and it didn't work for how we would approach, what we want to do to engage, et cetera. If that startup had come to us earlier on and had a more open discussion about business and about their model, I could have given them feedback to help them shift the model to be more brand friendly, to really fit the business model that they were going after. And that's a huge, huge value if you think about partnership versus only selling, of how can you work together to make the business better. Now, at the same token, that same value can be delivered from a startup to a brand to really help them as well. That if you think about the fact of what a brand manager is challenged with, they're driving market share, dollar, getting those shelf, that shelf space at a Walmart or a Target, they have these different challenges. Startups are often gonna be closer to the pulse of what's changing in technology what's changing in the world of digital media. You can provide that education. You can provide that teaching and that capability building because oftentimes in the day-to-day -day of running, uh, brand manager running to all their different meetings, trying to get that new product, that new initiative out the door, sometimes they're not having as much time to build their own capability as they'd want. And you as a startup can provide that. Don't go in just selling what your startup can do. Go in selling about the trends that are happening in the industry. Why is location-based services gonna be something that really drives through a business? Why is that gonna be something that transforms how retail shopping goes about with brands connecting? Don't go in just selling your brand name and your startup. Go in selling the trends. Go in talking about how trends are gonna change the way they connect with their consumers and the way they go about business. Suddenly, you become a consultant and a, a value add to their day-to-day -day lives not just somebody that's hawking the latest good and the latest shiny object. And that's the value you can really add and help each other be better at business. Now, what are some examples of people that have done this well? You know, one example that just run, launched recently was actually one with Procter & Gamble uh, for Future Friendly, which is their sustainability initiative that they're going. And they did a deal with Shazam, where when you see a Future Friendly commercial go up on, uh, on the TV, you can load up Shazam and do a quick to get new content delivered. You know, this is a great thing for the brands because what it do does is deliver engagement. It delivers a way to take what's traditionally a mass media tool being TV and turn it into an engagement vehicle, a way to deliver more information to people. Because right now, brands oftentimes still rely on flashing up their URL or their Facebook fan page at the end of a TV spot. And how many people actually are re writing that down and remembering to go to it afterwards? It's not a whole lot. But through something like this, they deliver that instant engagement. You know, personally for me, I was a little skeptical at first of how many people are sitting there with their phone in hand with willing to click on this app and load it up and have it instantly work. But the shocking thing is you can never underestimate what consumers actually are gonna do. 
because hundreds of thousands of people are actually doing this very thing. They're actually clicking that Shazam button and interacting with the TV spot while they're watching that TV show. And it's amazing to kind of see that engagement and see where it can go. Another example is what Clout has been doing. Uh, influencer marketing is not new. You know, brands have been doing influencer marketing for ages upon ages. But influencers used to be beauty magazine editors, tech magazines, the people that you could easily identify because of the title that they had after their name and the publication and the circulation that they had. But influencers by nature have changed today. And it's a lot more difficult for a brand to really identify those specific influencers that can help spread their word and spread their brands. Clout's been doing a great way at, at approaching this with their clout perks of giving a way for brands to really engage with different types of influencers and ones that probably historically would have been nowhere on their radar to engage with. You know, this example is from what they did with Hewlett Packard of really identifying who are those people that could spread the message in a tech world for them and engage in a different way. And that's a great example of brands working with startups and startups working with brands to make a better experience where they're addressing both the needs of that individual brand, but also the way the startup can naturally fit a business model in. That this isn't just about identifying the influencers, but then being a gateway to them at the same time, which is a powerful, powerful tool. And the final example I'll show is from a company called uh, uh, TapMe. And TapMe is an interesting one in the mobile in-game advertising space. They're just launching right now, and they did, they're doing a deal with Redbox, where they can bring in-game achievements of how can I reward somebody for getting their new high score beyond just putting them up on a leaderboard? How can I give them engagement in the real world in different experiences? But also, how can I deliver things that would build the brand equity? Because the thing that brands are historically always trying to find is a combination between reach and engagement. And that's always gonna be a tension point. How do I reach the most people possible? How do I reach millions, upon pe millions of people but then also, how do I drive engagement with them so they interact in a deeper way and deeper experience? That's what uh, TapMe is trying to do by delivering mass scale through the game system along with engagement around specific brands, around specific equity that might be built. It's a really cool tool that they're exploring and Redbox is one of their first partners. It's actually one that uh, Red Rockfish Brand Ventures, our division, this is gonna be our first investment that we're making because we see this power and this ability as well to really drive great things for our clients to more closely engage and more closely partner with these two experiences coming together. So in conclusion, the thing I just leave you with is working with brands and working with startups, the two have a lot of long ways to go in terms of gain that partnership, gain that level really working together for meaningful, meaningful change. And you know, the words from uh, Tim Westergren, who's the founder of Pandora, I think most aptly sum this up, when he says, just be pre prepared for a long and uncertain journey. The good stuff doesn't come easy. And that's the fact of the matter when it comes to brands and startups working together, is that they don't have to be in conflict, they can be in partnership to really drive great experiences, but it's gonna take work, it's gonna take effort, and there's never gonna be a silver bullet, but there's steps along the way that can make better experiences and make better business as a result. So thank you for your time, and I think we're gonna do uh, some Q&A now. All right, great, looks like we have a few minutes. Um, so if you have a question, you could start making your way to the microphones on either side um, so people can hear you. And I guess, um, I'm, I'm just curious, first of all, um, how brands can find these opportunities when they're not necessarily embedded in the startup world. Yep. So I think there's a couple things. Is, uh, for me, I do think brands need to become uh, part of the ecosystem uh, and get involved. Coming to things like this is a great first step. Uh, the th fact of the matter is it's really easy to discover what's going on in the startup world uh, because of the fact of the digital media world. Uh, being able to track on all of the different publications, what's going on, what startups are out there, who's getting funded, I think that's number one. Um, number two is doing partnerships with investors. Uh, both seed stage and venture capitalists. Uh, for me, I always say that uh, the venture capitalists are my canary in the marketing coal mine. Um, they're s looking at pattern recognition, where things are going, and it's a great way to see what's coming up and what should brands be paying attention to, but also understand from people that are investing and spending day and day working with these startups, which ones are ready uh, 
to be able to talk to a brand and not ones that you might drive off a cliff with your, your advice. Hi. Uh, so let's say there's a startup, but they might not be in Silicon Valley. They may not be in New York. They're in Kansas or somewhere. How do they find you know, these big brands? Do you work through the agencies? Do you go to the brand manager? How, how do you actually get to a decision maker that says, this is interesting. Yeah, we could embed your thing into our thing yep. that goes into Walmart. Yeah, so uh, as a passionate Midwesterner myself, uh, based in Cincinnati, uh, so you're at an inherent competitive advantage by being based in the Midwest. Uh, because let's look at the world's largest brands out there. Um, Kraft isn't in New York, isn't in San Fran. P&G isn't there. Target isn't there. Walmart isn't there. Go down the list of the biggest advertisers in the world they're actually not in the coast. So your inherent competitive advantage being in those cities to be able to do deals and to do relationships because you can live and work with those folks. When you go to make it up an American Marketing Association meeting in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. you might be with the Tide Marketing Director that has a $2 billion budget. Um, so that's how you do it, is don't think of it as the flyover. It's the place you actually need to be if you want to do your business development and your best relationships. Are you better off going to their agency or directly to the, pro is it Both. the product manager or who, who is it? It, it tied, it yeah. just, I, I've got a something, I don't know, a gizmo that's gonna make the clothes wash better. Yep. It's both, because um, no, br no brand is the same, no company's the same. Yeah. Um, Tide is frankly gonna be different than Pampers. Um, so you need to be going after both and understanding the decision makers and understanding who's going what. Um, but I think going after the brands and the agencies at the same time is the way to go um, and getting involved. Um, there are some companies that very, very smartly have opened up small offices in Cincinnati. And mm -hmm. every example you see talked about where P&G is the one, the brand they're working with, there's a reason they've got that competitive advantage because they're working day to day, uh, not just trying to fly in and do a sale. So, so is this your core business? That's what I didn't understand. Huh? Is this what Rockfish does? Uh, Rockfish is a digital agency uh, that also has an incubator oh, okay. uh, internally okay. and a venture capital unit. So okay. we're, uh, we're a very dynamic, different place. Okay, thanks. All right, it looks like we have time for about two more questions. And I have one. Um, can you talk about some of the risks involved um, in working with startups? Yeah, I think uh, there's a couple of different risks. One of the, the biggest risks is probably uh, the fact that startups pivot and change and evolve. And um, when a brand is shifting a lot of dollars, they're usually timing it around something very specific. A new product is launching on store shelves June 1st, and I promise Walmart all of this. Um, that timing and being able to align and deliver and have to be able to do that is a really risky part of when you're working with a startup that might not have the resources to definitely guarantee it's gonna release on that date and be ready to go big on that. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest risks that goes along with it. Um, I think the other risk is, frankly, giving advice that could be detrimental to the startups uh, because you're seen as big dollars and big possibilities and your advice might be a piece of advice that's valuable but isn't the solution to everything and forcing them to go down a path to get a deal that might be detrimental to the startup in the long term. You had a question. How are you doing? Uh, Jacob Cohen from Wolf Holdings. Uh, so I'm curious, all the sort of development startups are doing, and then the sort of trend within corporations to do fast failure, get things out iteratively, innovate quickly. Do you see businesses starting to maybe develop their own kinds of technology, uh, bring in those types of brains in-house to be able to produce products, um, essentially as digital products that to, to support their businesses? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, and it's nothing new. So uh, when I was at P&G, one of the things I was involved in was uh, P&G Productions. Uh, for 70 years, P&G has been creating TV shows and movies and content and everything else. Uh, you know, they literally invented the soap opera 70 years ago. And as a result, we're now launching digital media properties. And so Homemade Simple, Man of the House, these are all digital media platforms that have great tools, abilities. And some of us are deciding to launch those internal resources. Red Bull is an example that they have folks on staff doing that. Some are partnering with their agencies to do it. 
And some are even buying small startups to bring that resource in-house and that ability in-house. Um, so content creation by brands isn't anything new, but it's gonna gain acceleration without a doubt over the coming years in a, in a big, big way. Do you see that there's any particular trend of like one solution to that, or do you see a variety of options? I think it's gonna be a variety of options that uh, there isn't gonna be a one size fits all. Um, you know, for a P&G, they're probably always going to work with partners uh, and work with their agencies um, because of how career paths go and how they develop people. Um, somebody like a Red Bull might decide on a completely different path of bringing it all in-house because of how they're structured and how they go. So I don't think there is going to be a one-size-fits-all solution, uh, which is good for all of us because it's never good if there's only one way to do things. Cool. Thank you. Okay. And thanks so much, David, for being here. Thank you.